Welcome to the Honeywell Apex Tips and Tricks webinar. I'm Steve Hammack. I'm a program pilot in Honeywell's Flight Technical Services Group here in Phoenix, Arizona. This presentation is Honeywell proprietary information, is subject to export restrictions, and is intended for personal use only. So let's get started. We'll start out talking briefly about some of the unique features of Honeywell's SmartView Synthetic Vision System and ways to use it. Then we'll move into some useful features for VFR operations, tips and tricks, and we'll finish up with available resources. SmartView is Honeywell's name for its synthetic vision system. Today, I'm just going to touch on a few of the unique features of SmartView and how to use them. At the end, I'll share a link to some free videos where you can find out more about SmartView and other Apex features. When SmartView was introduced, we changed the standard PFD format to the full blue over brown format shown on the right-hand display. This was done so that there was a seamless transition from the, when synthetic vision is off to when it's turned on. In addition to the full screen blue over brown display, some of the other major changes were the addition of the dynamic speed bug and the pitch scale change. The pitch scale change sounds like a minor thing, but it's actually very important. Some synthetic vision systems are just pretty 3D background pictures. Smart view is a conformal display, which means that the display elements in the background terrain are at the same scale. So when the flight path symbol is three degrees up and it shows that you will clear a mountain top, that is what will happen. It's more than just a pretty picture. Smart view starts out with the standard primary flight display functions. Honeywell's proven EGPWS terrain database is used to provide an accurate 3D background terrain image. But SmartView goes even further by adding head-up display, or HUD symbology, to the PFD, providing an accurate means of controlling the aircraft's flight path, along with unique energy management features. Let's take a quick look at some of the design elements so we can pull it all together in just a few slides from now. The zero pitch, or zero path reference line, can be thought of as a line tangential to the Earth's surface at your current location. The line is transposed at your altitude and represents the true horizon. Anything above the line is above you, and anything below the line is below you. The flight path symbol represents the aircraft's flight path angle and track over the ground. If the flight path symbol is below an obstacle or terrain on the image behind it on the PFD, the current aircraft flight path will not clear the obstacle or terrain if the path of the aircraft is not changed. One big difference between SmartView and other systems is that it's a track-based system. In other words, the image is centered around where you're going, your track, and not where you're pointed, you're heading. Once you've flown SmartView, you realize all systems should be this way. We indicate the aircraft's heading on the display so that you can visualize your crab angle. Why do we go with a track-centered system? There are several distinct advantages to this method, including it keeps the flight path symbol in the center of the display and the background synthetic vision image centered on the aircraft's track, where you're going not where you're pointed. And that provides a very stable picture because your track doesn't change in turbulence or varying wind conditions, whereas your heading certainly does. So you can start to see how this is coming together. Here we have the flight path symbol on our runway touchdown point. The flight path symbol is on the three degree tick mark on the pitch scale, and therefore we are flying a three degree flight path angle to the touchdown point. And we can see that we are clear of any terrain or known obstacles. The last piece is the energy management part, another distinguishing feature of SmartView. The dynamic speed bug provides a stable target of 1.3 VS in all configurations without the need to correct for the aircraft's weight. It is angle of attack based and filtered, providing a stable speed target during approach. Another unique and extremely useful feature of synthetic vision is the acceleration chevron. The angular position of the acceleration chevron indicates the total aircraft energy. Let's look at some ways to use this feature. In the picture on the left, the flight path symbol is above the zero pitch reference line, and the acceleration chevron is above the flight path symbol. This indicates that the aircraft is climbing and accelerating because there is more energy available than needed. In the center picture, the aircraft is in straight and level, unaccelerated flight because everything is in alignment. In the picture on the right, we are descending and decelerating. Let's look at some other ways to use this feature. In the picture shown, the mountain ahead of us is higher than the aircraft because it is above the zero pitch reference line. We're not climbing, and with current power setting, we don't have sufficient energy to clear the mountain and maintain airspeed. 
So we add power and the acceleration chevron rises to show our increased energy state. This means that we can pitch up to where the acceleration chevron is and clear the mountain maintaining a constant airspeed. So now we have pitched up aligning the flight path symbol and the acceleration chevron and we will now clear the mountain. We'll finish up talking about synthetic vision by speaking about two uses that you might not have thought of. Remember that you have three modes, the two existing pitch-based modes with the flying wedge and gull wings, plus the path-based mode. The pitch-based modes show where you're pointed, and the path-based mode shows where you're going. The flight path is dependent upon your ground speed and wind, so as the wind changes, so will your flight path. So if you encounter a wind shear, there will be a wind change in both speed and direction that affects your flight path. This will cause the flight path symbol to make a significant jump up or down on the display. Assume you had the flight path symbol on the zero pitch reference line, and a second later you saw this picture. Your flight path symbol has moved significantly downward, indicating your new path as a result of the wind change. Since many of the aircraft Apex is installed on do not have a reactive wind shear system installed, it is a valuable resource for early wind shear detection. There's nothing wrong with your display here. We've just taken off in low visibility conditions and are climbing out when the engine fails and now you're faced with an engine out IMC turnback in very low visibility and this is what you see, nothing. If you have synthetic vision, this is what you would see. If you have the FMS set up, you will have a 10 nautical mile lead in line or extended center line to the runway. And as you get closer, the runway detail appears. I'd much rather be looking at the picture on the left as I'm waiting for the runway to appear out the window. Try these two procedures in the sim to see what a fantastic situational awareness tool SmartView is. As a short summary, SmartView is built off of our proven EGPWS terrain database, which has over 800 million hours of real world use. It's not just a pretty background picture, it's a conformal track-centered display allowing advanced features like HUD symbology and energy management with growth potential. We have a lot of operators that do VFR operations, so we wanted to point out some of the features that are useful for VFR ops. Of course, synthetic vision makes every day, and night for that matter, a bright, sunny, cloud-free day. If you need to know where the sun rises and sun sets in local or UTC time, you can look at this using the show info for an airport. Using the Geo tab, you can select VFR reporting points or VFR reference points to be displayed on the INAV moving map display. Also on the Geo drop-down menu, you can enable the display of airspace boundaries, their name, and associated altitude constraints. In an emergency, the nearest airport is just a button push away. Pressing the nearest button brings up the nearest airport's dialog box showing the bearing, distance, altitude, and runway length of the nearest airports. Pressing Divert 2 enters the airport as a destination airport in the active flight plan, clearing any other waypoints. One of my favorites is the altitude intercept arc. When you put an altitude in the altitude preselector, the altitude intercept arc shows where you will reach your selected altitude. It's great for adjusting your rate of climb or descent. And in an emergency, it will show you your gliding distance once established at best glide speed. In engine out situation, it aids in selecting a landing runway. It is displayed in heading up mode when you are climbing or descending at at least 300 feet per minute. At the bottom of the display is the VSD, or vertical situation display. The VSD shows the vertical flight plan, your actual flight path, the terrain along your flight plan, or the terrain along your track if you're not following your flight plan. It also shows altitudes like top of climb, top of descent, altitude constraints, ILS glide slope, and more. So it's great for IFR and VFR operations. I'll end this section mentioning the track line. This isn't a great picture, but it illustrates a good real world example of using the track line. On the guidance panel, you can easily switch between heading and track. The benefit of using track is that you don't need to correct for wind drift. You'll follow the selected track regardless of the wind. So if you were doing a circling approach, using track instead of heading is much easier. The same if you're trying to intercept or, as shown here, avoiding weather. Now let's look at some tips and tricks. The majority of these came from customers in one way or the other. Some are things you may have forgotten or didn't know the system could do. Others are questions we've answered, things we've observed, plus we'll look at why things may be somewhat different from other systems you may have used in the past. One of the questions we get quite often is, why do I need to enter all of this initialization information to get going? We usually get this question from two different reasons. One is the pilot moving up to a turboprop 
and the other is from the VFR pilot who just wants to enter a direct to and get going. Another subset of that is the group that wants to get out VFR and then pick up their IFR clearance in the air. If you're used to just entering an origin, destination, and perhaps a few en route waypoints, we call that a GPS navigator. Apex is a full performance FMS system, which means based on the information that you provide and the data that the system senses, the performance function of the FMS can predict all of the altitudes, speeds, fuel, and times for the entire route with great accuracy. If you want the full VNAV capability, you need to spend a few seconds entering some basic information so the system can make the calculations. Part of the FAA's next-gen system includes 4D trajectories. A flight plan would include waypoints with altitude and time restrictions. All of these 4D waypoints would be data linked to the aircraft and auto throttles would control speed to meet the constraints. That is what a full performance FMS can do and we have auto throttles on some Apex equipped aircraft. But, if you just want to use the system as a GPS navigator, you can. Just enter the origin, destination, and go. If you want to enter more waypoints later, you can. And if you want VNAV later, you can go back and enter the performance information. A lot of people think it's a requirement to enter the perf and it data, but it's not. Switching topics now, the 51500 rule is an old rule of thumb that says to be on a three degree slope, you should be 1500 feet above the touchdown elevation five miles out. So let's look at a way we can easily do this. Here we have a simple flight plan created. We're departing Flagstaff, KFLG, runway 21, then Oates intersection, and landing at Goodyear, KGEU, on runway 19. Just to verify my work, I select a five nautical mile range ring. I click on runway 19 and select Show Info, and look at the runway data. 190 degrees is probably good enough, but we'll use the 194 degrees shown. The reciprocal of 194 degrees is 14 degrees. So now I click on Oats and select a men route. After Oats intersection, I'm going to enter a place bearing distance waypoint in exactly that format. So the place is KGEU, Goodyear. The bearing is 014, the reciprocal of 194, and the distance is 5.4. More about that in just a second. You can see on the INAV map in the vertical situation display that we now have a waypoint five nautical miles out from the runway on a nice three degree path. If you want a nice VNAV target, you can place an at constraint on the waypoint. Here I made the altitude constraint at 2,700 feet calculated. Notice where the airport reference point is. It's not right at the end of the runway because we use KGEU, the airport, so it's using the airport reference point and that's why we needed 5.4 nautical miles instead of five nautical miles exactly. So it's not exact, but it's simple, easy to use, and you can couple to it. Now we're going to do a trip from Phoenix Deer Valley Airport, KDVT, to Rocky Mountain Metropolitan Airport, Jeffco, in Denver, Colorado, KBJC. We've entered our origin and destination and the Phoenix Deer Valley 1 departure procedure. Now we're ready to enter all the en route waypoints. The Phoenix Deer Valley 1 departure ends at the Phoenix VOR. Our route after the Phoenix VOR is along Victor 95, and our exit waypoint is the Falcon VOR, FQF. The exit waypoint is just where we'll end our route along Victor 95. We do this simply by entering v95.fqf, and the system automatically enters all the en route waypoints along Victor 95 between the Phoenix VOR and our exit waypoint. That's 596 nautical miles of en route waypoints in just seconds. If you're used to entering all of your en route waypoints manually, this is a great time saver and something that has been in the Apex system since the beginning but is often overlooked and underutilized because the feature didn't exist in other systems. If we're continuing on, we could string another set of waypoints just as easily. For example, out of the Falcon VOR, we can enter Victor148.cmx and that will take us another 859 nautical miles to the Houghton VOR in Michigan along Victor148. Let's fly this route to show you some other features of Apex. In the top left is the Phoenix Deer Valley 1 departure procedure. You intercept the 336 degree radial out of the Phoenix VOR, which the red arrow points to, and also happens to be Victor 257. Upon reaching 4,000 feet, you turn left and proceed to the Phoenix VOR. The problem is that ATC never lets you do this unless you're headed to the south. They're not going to bring you into the busy Phoenix class Bravo airspace so they always vector you to intercept your course, which in this case is the red circle, Victor 95. 
So here is our aircraft in yellow, the Phoenix VOR is down in the lower left, and the magenta line is our next leg to the Winslow VOR in the upper right. As expected, ATC keeps us out of the Class Bravo airspace with the following instructions. Radar contact, fly heading 047, and intercept Victor 95, our original course. Most people would select the Winslow VOR, INW, and select intercept, and that would work, but there's an easier way in this case. But first, a little bit of background and some differences training. FMS systems and GPS navigators come in two basic flavors. They either fly to a waypoint, like Boeing and Garmin system, or they fly from a waypoint, like Airbus, Douglas, Fokker, got to be careful how you pronounce that one, and our EPIC and APEC systems. If you understand that small nuance, it helps. They really all fly to a waypoint, with the difference being what's shown in the first line, to or from waypoint, and how we activate a leg. So let's see how we use this. Since the leg from the Phoenix VOR to the Winslow VOR is already in our flight plan, all we need to do is make that the active leg. And we do this by selecting the Phoenix VOR and making it the from waypoint. That's it, just arm nav and the system will automatically intercept the leg and we're on our route to Winslow. On systems that fly to a waypoint, it's the same principle. You do it in a similar way by selecting activate leg. Now we're further along our route and ATC needs to reroute us because of a military operations area that just went active. We're told to fly heading 360 and intercept Victor 567. The only problem is you can't find Victor 567 on the map. So what do you do? All you do is select the info button on the multifunction controller and enter in Victor 567 in the search box. Apex finds Victor 567 and scales the map to the closest point of intercept. Now we can range in and out, keeping Victor 567 on the display, and we can see that ATC is vectoring us to the north and west of our planned route. Now we have a new destination, Flagstaff. We're VFR at night in mountainous terrain, and we want some additional terrain clearance. This is a question we get quite often. We could do our 5 1500 rule, but there's another method. We're not going to fly the approach, but we can use the approach waypoints and adjust them to give us a steeper approach angle with more terrain clearance. So we enter the waypoint SESKI in our flight plan. We see from the angle we have a nice three degree slope to the runway, but we'd like to have a four degree path. All we do is select SESKI in the cross dialog box, select the angle checkbox, and enter four degrees. The system will calculate a new altitude and top of descent point based on the new four degree angle. Prior to top of descent, we dial in our desired altitude. In this case, we put in 7,100 feet and we can fly a coupled V-path descent to the runway. And it flies the entire visual approach at a four degree angle until you disconnect the autopilot. Simple. Now we'll do a quick review of some functions you might not use all that often, like intercepts and temporary waypoints. AC directs us as follows. After gallop, radar vectors to intercept the 065 degree course inbound to the Alamosa VOR. So we would select the Alamosa VOR from either the flight plan waypoint list or the INAB map and select intercept. A dialog box appears and we can use the multifunction controller knob or the CCD scroll wheel to select the 065 degree inbound course. Notice the white ticks marks on the compass rows. They represent airways in and out of the VOR. In the picture on the left, we have a course selected of 270 degrees. The red arrow points to one of the white tick marks we're going to move the arrow to. As we move the course over the white tick mark at 281 degrees, we can see the airway Victor 264 appears at the bottom left. After you activate the change, the system changes to heading mode, so you rearm nav to intercept. Now we'll look at another type of intercept in temporary waypoint, the place bearing, place bearing. This is flying from one radial to intercept another radial. Let's say we're told to fly the 090 radial from the Gallup VOR and intercept the 180 degree radial from the Alamosa VOR. That's exactly what we'll enter, place bearing, place bearing, or Gallup, G-U-P, slash 090, slash Alamosa, A-L-S, slash 180. I use VORs in these examples, but the place doesn't need to be a VOR. We can use VORs, airports, like I used in my 51500 example, waypoints, basically any place that is defined in the database. 
Here's another question posed by a customer. And they could see the actual wind speed, direction, and outside air temperature, but the predictions were quite different and they wondered why. Earlier I mentioned that FMS predictions are based on what you enter and what the system senses and calculates. The better the information provided, the better the results. So my first question to the customer is, what winds did you enter? And the answer, of course, was I didn't enter any. Notice that the waypoints in question here are over 400 nautical miles away. If you don't enter any wind information, the system will use zero degrees at zero knots as the entered winds and ISA standard deviation. On the ground, you don't have any sensed wind information. Once airborne, the sensed wind information is blended with the entered winds. The blending model follows this chart. From zero to 200 nautical miles ahead, the system uses only the actual sensed winds. From 200 to 400 nautical miles ahead, it's a 50-50 blend of sensed and entered winds. Beyond 400 nautical miles, it's 20% sensed winds and 80% entered winds. So if you remember the picture, the waypoints were over 400 nautical miles away and they didn't enter any wind information, so the zero degrees at zero knots was being blended in at 80%. On short trips, you really don't need to enter wind data, but on longer ones, it will really improve the predictions if you do. There are several ways to enter the wind data. You can use the cross dialog box and select the wind temp ISA. Here you can enter the information in the dialog box. If you enter a value at the first waypoint, it will ripple that value through the rest of the waypoints. If nothing else, many of the flight planning programs give average winds, and you can enter that, or when you get up to cruise altitude, enter the sense winds. If you want to be more precise, you can save your flight plan and wind information on an SD card with PC Apex and load it on the aircraft. Even easier, if you use our MyGDC flight planning app and have the wireless connected flight deck on your aircraft, you can load your flight plan and wind temp data right from your iPad. Now let's look at some resources that are available to you. One is the Honeywell Direct Access app. It allows you to contact the AOG desk 24-7 and order spare parts. Using devices with location services, you can search and contact local technical support, access business and sales support, and access local dealers and service centers based on your location. Our newest resource is the Honeywell Pilot Gateway. This is available as a web page at pilots.honeywell.com or as of October we now have an app for that. Just search for Honeywell Pilot Gateway in the App Store or in Google Play. Just log in, select your OEM and aircraft type, and you have access to documents associated with your aircraft including service information letters, service bulletins, FMS information, including pilot's guides, familiarization guides, and videos. Also, our FMS newsletter and a contact page where you can send questions directly to the technical team. Hopefully, most of you are aware of the videos we produced. We have about 23 of them now covering everything from synthetic vision, VNAV, and LPV to the basics of entering a flight plan. They're available on YouTube or on the link shown at the top of the page. We're also changing the format of the pilot's guides to be more aesthetically pleasing. They're more colorful with drop shadows, hyperlinks, and QR codes to the videos. For instance, if you're in the section on synthetic vision, you can click the link to see the video or point your iPad or iPhone on the QR code and the video will open automatically for you. We'll also be incorporating a quick reference guide section into the electronic version of the pilot's guide. This will walk you through many common tasks. We're also working on EPUB version. These will work on Kindles, Nooks, Androids, Sony, Apple, etc. And we'll have normal iBook features like the ability to bookmark pages, search, change font sizes, zoom in on pictures, and reflow text. So lots of nice changes coming. That finishes up our webinar for today. I want to thank you for joining us today.